Welcome to another edition of the SprintCarLimited.com Deep Dive presented by Entrust IT Solutions. Joining us on this week's show is Sprint Car legend and car owner, Don Kreitz Jr. Before we get to Don, don't forget to check out Entrust IT Solutions. Entrust is a full-service technology company serving small and mid-sized businesses in New York, Pennsylvania, and surrounding areas. The staff at Entrust takes a personalized approach to technology. See why customers are choosing Entrust IT Solutions as their technology partner by scheduling a free consultation at www.entrust-msp.com or by calling 717-292-8868. Here's Don. Donnie, welcome to the deep dive. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. You know, we were joking a little bit, Don, Donald, Donnie, I've heard it pronounced by Bruce Ellis and all the other announcers in the area. Which one do you prefer? Uh, Don is fine or, <laughs> or, or Donnie, you know, I answered all of them. <laughs> uh, I never knew it's, and some years it changed with the same guy. I, I, I never knew. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so. You've, you know, I was doing some research and, and, and again, I, I appreciate you being on the show. You've had a really good career. I mean, a great career and picked up things really fast, but I'm going to go back to the beginning to kind of to kick things off your dad race, Don senior ran modifieds. Um, how much of an influence was he on your racing career? Well, uh, a, a lot. And the, and the reason we started because when when I was starting, the Reading Fairgrounds were still here. So that's only 10 minutes from our house, shop, whatever. So we went there, we built Modifieds, and I got started in, in Modifieds, and, and that's how we got started. My dad was racing, and, and uh, that's how we got going. I believe it was 1978 you started. I think you were in high school yet. You were a junior, I guess. And you started racing sports for modifieds at Reading and Grandview. Um, was there a love of the sport? This wasn't just to follow in your dad's footsteps. Did you have that love of the sport, that passion uh, growing up around it? I always really liked racing and looked forward to, to going to the races, you know, because I went there all the time with my father basically my whole life up to that point. And I was probably late working on his car. I'm going to say probably not till where well, I was really working on it, you know, 12 ish in that, in that range, I'm going to say. Uh, so I did. And I hadn't, I mean, we had mini bikes and race, you know, but when you're brought up in racing, you race everything. Now I, you know, wasn't into go karts because my dad raced every weekend. And back then it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or, micros or or quarter midgets or or nothing so when i started when i was 16 that was the first time you know i was really actually racing beside racing around the house or something now you again a quick study first year rookie of the year you were able to win i mean did it just come natural to you uh it, it's amazing to me and i i seen it like the first time when Cassidy ever got on the track because she never really got to run anything because I was always racing when you're brought up into it and you go to the racing, go to the races all the time. It's almost like you raced, even though you didn't like you, like, you know, everything, what to do, even though you never, you know, drove the car around or, or whatever. So I, I don't know why that is, but it just seems like it is. You know, I when we were talking off air, I people kind of chuckle because uh, I started. I actually my first race was a modified race at Penn National Speedway, and here I am doing sprint cars. But uh, you made the transition to sprint cars in 1983. What made you go that direction? What drew you to that division? So the reason we got into racing again was because of the Reading Fairgrounds, and then it shut down, and then. The modifieds that we had, different rules at all the tracks you went to, and and it was a pain in the butt. And one of our customers back when we were building modifieds was Dave Kelly, who was a URC yep. champion. And he said to me, you should try sprint cars, you know, and 
so at the time it, he was in urc and so we were getting a 360 basically it was a 360 car a urc car because they ran out a lot of the modified tracks so i could go there and run my modified and then take this sprint car along because you know we didn't know how it was going to go and we just went in it cold cold turkey you know we, i didn't jump in anyone's car and try it first or whatever we just you know jumped in it and went so that's how we got going uh is is actually how why we got into sprint cars and how we got started uh, did you win your first race we did so our first <laughs> our very first race you know was a urc race it was actually at big diamond at a modified track and uh unbeknownst to me when i got there and because it was like the opening day race for them uh everyone drew well i went up to draw and they said no rookies have to start in the back so i started in the back of the heat so my first heat race i got up to top three or four whatever it was so when i went to look at the lineup they had me starting 24th and i'm like what you know what's this well you're a rookie you got to start last for three races in every event I said, look, if you want to put me behind all the guys that made the invert, I think that's fair. I can understand that. Uh, so they ended up compromising. They put me 18th, you know, right before the B main cars, let's just say. So we were very fortunate to drive up through there and uh, and get that win. And I actually don't even recall if they still made me start in the back the second and the third race. So. <laughs> I'm dumbfounded about it. I've never, I don't know if I've seen you mad in all the years I've watched you race. You had to be mad. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I, I was pretty upset because, and, and nothing against anyone that's been, you know, there was no other 360s back then. There was no 358s. Like guys that ran URC would come and would be competitive at Williams Grove or in 410s. Like yeah. they were, really good drivers and and cars at that time uh you know it wasn't like it was a real lower class let's just say uh so it it was quite a bit tougher than if someone would just be starting out in 358s or 360s i can't believe they made you start 18th after you ran up to second or third in a heat race i think that was pretty much an audition yeah <laughs> <laughs> but so you ran some 410 races that year and I'd ask you if it was difficult, but you 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 won right away. So, but what was the transition from a modified to a 360 and a 410 sprint car like? Was that what did you have to change, if anything, about your driving style? And and why do you think you were so good at it so early on? The modified really helped me because even though I started in small block modifieds. And I don't know how much horsepower they were back then. That was carbureted. So I would guess it's maybe five in the 500 range, maybe less than that. I don't know. But the big class back then that would be equal to 410s was a big block modified. And I also ran them right away. So you have, you know, 460, whatever, 67 cubic inches on injectors back then, on big tires like we run on sprint cars, not like the modifieds are nowadays, those things were beasts, but obviously you don't have a wing on top. Mm -hmm. So it was basically almost like a non-wing sprint car. So when it came time for the feature, you had to be really smooth with the throttle, drive really smooth to hook the car up. So when I got into sprint cars, it, it was actually an easier transition for me that way. And that's how I got to be, you know, probably better on the, on the slick tracks because I kind of already had the lessons of working the throttle from the modified. So before I get into kind of the, the, the real meat of your career, you've always owned your cars. Why is that? What it, was it something that was ingrained from your dad? Was it something you saw as a kid? You didn't want to experience as far as getting let go. You always owned your own cars. So when I started racing, you know, my father told me, he said he, he did it both ways. You know, he actually drove professionally for 
Ken Bren and worked there on the cars and uh, did everything, drove for himself. He said, you know, you have the most fun and enjoyment and in control, not but when you own your own car, but it's hard to keep going. You're going to be broke at best. You know, you're never going to make anything. If you drive for someone, well, basically all you do is make money. You have very, you know, you have your expenses getting to the track yeah. or whatever, but you know, it's a lot better, but you got to put up with car owners that are a pain in the butt and this or that. So, you know, we started out and, uh, you know, once we started out going good in, in sprint cars, since we weren't good right away, I had offers along the way, but I did, I actually did a couple times. Uh, the one big time was I drove the Nance house car, yep. uh, you know, at Eldora for Daryl Saucier was actually running that, that team. And when I had offers all along the way, if I didn't think the car was better than my car, I didn't, I didn't do it. You know, I just, I, I wanted to race, but I wanted to make sure I was in a good car. And, uh, you know, when I went to do it a couple of times, jumping guys, cars, naturally, they don't want to just let you do whatever you wanted to do on setting the car up. And I figured I knew how to set the car up best for myself. And, you know, so they didn't, whenever I jumped in someone's car, it didn't go that good for me. Yeah, because, you know, there's difficulties with that. Like your dad said, I mean, if you own your own stuff, how difficult has it been over the years trying to maintain? I mean, look, the sport's not getting any cheaper. It was better back then. You could you could build stuff and do stuff. I mean, it, was there ever a point where you're like, man, I just can't do this anymore? Probably at least 100 times. <laughs> I mean, it, so, so many times we were on the brink of going out and, you know, when I was still driving and we won an outlaw show, we won a big, you know, like something just always bailed, bailed me out to be real honest with you or, you know, got a new sponsor that came along to help out or, or, or something, even up to this, you know, even up to this day now, you know, like if, the guys go away that are helping me. I'm probably going to be in serious trouble. You know, either we'd have to team up probably with someone else. I mean, we'd still have some stuff, but I don't own any of the motors right now. You know, we just did what we had to do to be able to keep racing. But, you know, you make sacrifices and you don't make any money along the way. But, uh, you know, I just always did it my way and right or wrong. That's that's what we did. So you left Modifieds and you went mm -hmm. full, you went full time uh, with the sprint car, I believe. Was it 84? Somewhere it was, along. Uh, correct. 84 would have been the first year I was full time sprint car. In 83, I ran the whole URC circuit, but still had my modified. Uh, but that that's what I did. And then at the actually at the end of that first year, because we had such a good year. We got a 410 sprint car, uh, uh, excuse me, an engine at the end of that year. And there was a real big, at the time, was the biggest sprint car race. And it was in September-ish, maybe like a week or so before the National Open, was at Pennsboro, West Virginia, had 25,000 to win in 1983. And the Outlaws were on the West Coast. It was the year before... They started the Kings Royal, which had been at that time, Knoxville didn't pay. You right. Know, what's the biggest really of that way? So this Pennsboro race was the biggest sprint car race ever. And I got a 410. We had trouble, worked all night, drove all night, got down there the next day, drew like second to last in time trials, never sat in a 410 car, you know, never drove with a 410 or anything. And went out and had quick time and never saw the track before, never nothing. And we had the track ended up, it was a day show rubber and down and we started sixth and finished fifth and there was no passing. But just to show you how racing is the next week, we come to Williams Grove for the national open with that 410 motor. We had, I'm in a heat. I still remember with Lynn Paxton, who was tops at that time. I beat him in the heat race. First time I'm ever there. 
and we go out. Uh, actually, I was beating him in the heat race. The last lap of the heat race, the motor blows up. I had one race on it, went to run that. It blew up. That was the night before the National Open. Come back the next day, I stuck a 360 in, my 360 in. At that time, they took 15 out of time trials right into the show, and the rest of the guys ran 1B main, the whole rest of the <laughs> field. I timed 15th out of with my 360 against like 5410 cars. Was locked into the show. They had warm ups before the feature going down the back stretch. My steering broke and ran in the wall and flipped, and I didn't even get to run the <laughs> race. I was in the hospital. <laughs> so that was that was my that was my first year of of sprint cars. And then we actually came back. Lincoln had twin twenties at the end of the year. I only had my three sixty. We went there and won a four ten show with our three sixty at Lincoln at the end of our first year. Well, I, I thought that was something that just started, you know, in the last 10, 15 years. You were doing it in the 80s. You know, you stayed with it. You go full time. Uh, and then 1986 rolls around. And you win the King's Royal. You know, it was it was unexpected. You know, Doug Wolfgang was in the 29 at the time. Bobby Allen was, I mean, you had everybody there. And here you guys come in and win that event. How big was that for your career at that time? You're only in your fourth year of sprint car racing. I mean, no one knew who I was out there, really, outside of PA, you know. And and we went out there, and we went there two weeks prior, Ohio Speed Week. There was an Ohio Speed Week show there, and I knew we wanted to try and go to this King's Royal. So we went there. So I did at least have some laps on the car before the King's Royal, and, uh, you know, we went there and uh, again, Doug Wolfgang, you're right, was running the 29. Davy Brown was helping him. So I knew Davy back then still. And, uh, I, you know, Davy told Wolfgang, hey, help the kid out here, you know, so <laughs> don't get hurt. At least put him in the right direction. Well, everything was different than the way I did it. At that time, I was actually still carrying modified setups over to my sprint car. Uh, at that point and it just it was working for me and I, the setups at wolf that they gave me did not work for me and when we went back for the king's royal we just did all our own stuff and you know everything just fell right i mean we timed third we started sixth and won our heat race i, I mean every we were fast the whole time and then we were lucky though we would not have won with Doug Wolfgang had a flat and Dave Blaney and Bobby Allen, there was a Nerf bar on the track that all three of them ran over. And then uh, Jack Horton Shield was leading and, you know, uh, we just got in there with 10 laps to go. And that was that. You know, it's funny. Uh, I hear people because I started going to that race in 87. Hmm. And uh, I heard people know who's that Crits fella. <laughs> so when you say they didn't know you they they didn't but they knew you after that and and obviously to come back to set what was the reception back in central pennsylvania what was that like after winning that race it was tremendous first off out there at that time uh there was a few different bus trips that went out that yep you know i wasn't even aware of or whatever but anyway in victory lane i mean it felt it seemed like it was all of the stands no one left shouting pa posse even back then you know so uh it it was it was pretty cool and got a standing ovation when we came back home and ran we actually drove through the night and came back home uh susky susquehanna uh, ran the next day on a they were running sunday nights then every week we drove back home from the King's Royal, didn't go home, you know, drove right to Susky and went there and ran that night. So, uh, no, it was uh, it was cool. Then, I mean, you had a great year that year. It wasn't double digits, double digit races. And then all of a sudden you got the idea to go asphalt racing, which I've always found interesting. You sold your sprint car stuff in 87 and you go Bush Grand National Racing. 
What made you decide to tackle that beast? <laughs> well, it probably wasn't very smart, and I probably didn't do enough research. But, you know, I thought I'd just give myself a a shot, you know, in, in NASCAR. And it was actually incredibly amazing that we even did what we did because not only did I never run one lap on asphalt in anything – I never ran one lap in a late model type car, have only ever drove an open wheel car, a modified or a sprint car. I knew nothing about all their suspension stuff, knew nothing about what air pressure to run, knew nothing about nothing. And we were doing <laughs> it from up from up here, which is another double bed, you know, and would drive down south to run the show. So at that time, because I used to run every race you could run, I was running 100 races a year in a sprint car. The Bush, it was Bush back then. Their schedule was 30 races. 22 of them were on short tracks. Eight were on super speedways. So I'm like, there's no, and I could not afford to keep my sprint car stuff. It was one or the other. So I'm like, I'm never going to be satisfied just running eight races. I'll buy a short track car and at least I get to run 22 races. Right. So, you know. That's what we did. You know, we made the first race we were at. We made every race we went to. We were leading a race and ran out of fuel. You know, we ran incredibly well, really. And by halfway through the year, I, I seen the funds were, gonna, were going out. When I said I didn't research it enough, back then sprint cars were paying 2000 to win around here. All the tracks were. And here, when I went to run all these short track races, You'd run 200 laps and naturally you'd have to do an all day practice and, you know, time trials yeah. and everything. They paid 2000 to win. Like you'd spend $20,000 to run for 2000 mm -hmm. each time. So when I was seeing, I was going to run myself out of money. It was like halfway through the year, sold the car, got back in sprint car racing. And then I had a few calls <laughs> from down there different guys that called me that said what are you doing what why do you give up they're like none of them guys are just gonna put you in a car you know they want you to suffer a little bit and see how determined you are if you're gonna hang in there there was a lot of people looking at you you know why don't you come back down and honestly uh just like all them guys say that do it i mean they do it because it's a lot of money but it wasn't it was no fun compared to sprint car racing. I was not into, you know, driving there, doing a practice all day long, you know, and, and the least amount you did was race, you know, it, it just, it was everything else but racing. So I just, you know, gave up. This wasn't for you. It wasn't. No, I never, I no didn't. regrets. No, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I mean, it, Put a big hole in my sprint car career because now I had to build everything back up. Uh, but you know, I'm glad I did it because I would always say, Man, I wonder if you know I could have did that or what would have happened if I would have did it. So I'm glad I did it, and you know, everything worked out the way it should work out. Yeah, I mean, do you ever think with like what they like? I don't know when it, it started to boom then in the 90s. Do you ever think, Ooh, what if? Uh, uh, you know what? I, I don't really, because it just, it, it doesn't even bother me. I mean, I like sprint car racing so much more than that type of racing that, uh, it just, uh, it, it's okay. It, no, it would have been a lot more money if everything would pan out, you know, and you go through all that. But, uh, I guess I wasn't, you know, willing to do it. You had to come back and obviously build back up. When did you hook up? Well, first off, you mentioned Doug Wolfgang. I'll never forget. Doug Wolfgang told me back in the mid eighties, watch out for this guy. Um, he told people here when he did interviews, watch out for this guy, meaning you. That had to feel pretty good. So young in your sprint car career that one of the best all time and the best at that time was saying that about you it it did and you know i'm sure davy had some influence on that but uh i remember 
Doug would come up to me, you know, after a feature or something, and we were fortunate enough to beat him a few times. And uh, he'd say, I know what you're doing. And again, <laughs> this is still back to my modified stuff. Now, I, I'm still applying that to a sprint car to hook up when the track's dry and stuff. I know what you're doing. I'm just letting you know it's not right. <laughs> you're making it work. I don't know how you're making it work. It's not the right way to do a sprint car, but you are making it work, but it's not right. <laughs> that sounds like Doug Wolfgang knew a T. <laughs> yeah. No, he he was he was always very cordial to us, would come over and, and talk to us. And uh, you know, it was uh it was a good time back in back in those days when you think about all the good guys that were running at one time and came out of the area you know at that at that one time it was incredible when did you hook up with davy brown senior so the first time i mean i initially hooked up with him back in my small block modified days uh because davy used to be a modified guy right and uh davy was always known for porting heads so before nowadays you have, they're all machined on a CNC. So it used to not be like that. And I, he was known as one of the best headquarters in the, in the whole country. So we were down on horsepower in a small block modified. My dad said, and we used to winners rear ends is in York PA. Mm -hmm. So I used to drive there for our parts store once a week and pick up parts and rears and stuff. Davy Brown worked there. He built rears there. So my dad said to me, hey, stop and see this guy, you know, and I didn't know much of Dave. I knew of him, but I didn't know much of him. So this has to be in like 79. And uh, I go there and uh, anyway, and we got a set of heads from him. And, you know, we started winning races in the modified. They were really good. So we, we had that. But then when I started running sprint cars, you know, and then we never continued after that because we just weren't in the same circles. I never kept in touch right. with him or anything. After we got into uh, sprint cars and he was at Winners, you know, I went there and, and we'd talk a couple of minutes. I'd take him out to lunch or something. He says, I know who you are. I'm <laughs> watching you. You're coming along, you know. <laughs> and uh, so it just kind of, even though he was always helping other guys. So then the year when Wolfgang left, uh, there was always a race at the end of the year at Hagerstown after the Oktoberfest. So this was after that. And Davey calls me up and says, Hey, do you want to run Weikert's car, you know, at Hagerstown? And uh, this was 87. So now after I just got back in and I didn't have much, you know, I didn't have much equipment and I'm not going to turn a ride down in that car when Davey's working on it. Right. You know, and uh, Davey knew I was good at Hagerstown and uh, we did. We we go there. He said, be, told me where Weikert shop was since meet me there and we got everything ready. And they had nine engines there on engine stands, complete, ready to go. Davey said, OK, this motor here makes the most horsepower. This one drives the best. This one's the lightest. So this was before the weight limit. Right. He goes down the line. When he got to the one that was the lightest, because this was a day show at Hagerstown, I said, stop, let's put that one in. So anyway, we win the heat race from the back. We drew the last number of the invert, which was nine, drove to the front, was driving away. The motor blew, blew up. So I come in. They tow me in, stop there. And Davey says, I guess you picked the wrong motor out of all nine motors, you know. So that that was my experience with Weikert and Davey. And then Davey started helping me. He was helping guys and other drivers in the Weikert car. And I don't know if that's the time period Kenny Jacobs was in. You know, there was a yep, few different 88. drivers. Jimmy Sills, there was there were different drivers in there. And then at some point that stopped with Davey. And it was towards the end of 89. And he helped me at the National Open and things went good. And then he helped me a little bit in 90, but he got in with, uh, you know, my stuff didn't pay that good. And, you know, throughout the years, Davey, uh, you know, especially with his last stint, has always been really loyal to me. He knows I didn't have a lot of money and he liked the way I did things that I made a lot of stuff myself and this or that, the other thing. 
But if he had a really, really good paying job, he, you know, he took them and I don't blame him. So he was with Zedko in that stint for a while through the nineties and Chris Ash. And, you know, then at the end of 99, uh, I think after he split up with Ash, you know, I got him back and then he's really been with me ever since 99. Well, you were able to build back up at the end of the 80s. And from 90 to 92, you won 56 races. 93, you win the Williams Grove National Open. I would say probably your best three, four year stretch of your career. Would that be accurate? That is accurate. What started to click there? I mean, here you go. You you come into the sport like a whirlwind a little bit. Win the Kings Royal. You leave. Really not bad in Bush Grand National. You had three top tens. We're leading a race and and ran out of fuel. You come back, you build back up, and you win 56 races in three years. And then the following year, win the Williams Grove National Open. You had to be on top of the world at that point. Yeah, it would it was going, it was going good. And actually in ninety-three and maybe half of ninety-four, uh Davy's son, Davy Jr., was helping me. And uh he he was actually really good with the car. Uh, yep. Davey was building, senior was building the motors and, and his son was helping me, uh, you know, he'd come to the track and do the setup on the car and this or that. So we were really good together for a while. We hit a tough patch in the middle of 84 and uh, 94, excuse me. And I went back on my own and sprint car racing was transit transitioning more from doing everything yourself to professional engine builders. And it just went through an escalating cost at that point. And I had to scale back to running one night a week and really till the 93, not even really in 94, 93 was probably actually like the last year where I ran the full schedule. Like, you know, most of the guys would yep. do now, if it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, midweek shows, that was pretty much the end of it because I, I just, I couldn't keep up with the, uh, with the cost. The purses hadn't, you know, I think we were still running for 2000 to win and the cost just really escalated. And then from then on till I was done racing, really, I, I was mostly just one night a week at spe in special shows. Let's talk about those special shows. You got known as the sheriff at that time. You always good against the world of outlaws. How much did you gear up for those special shows against the Outlaws? It seemed to me weekly, I mean, you were still good, but you were really good when the Outlaws rolled into town, and it didn't seem to matter where you raced against them. So the whenever the Outlaws came in, and pretty much no matter what track they were at, the track operators, the guys that were doing the track, fixing the, the clay, the dirt, to prepare the track, did not keep up with when there's faster cars coming in and there's a lot of fast cars and you have all these time trials and stuff, the tracks would always get drier. And I was just damn lucky. I'll just be real honest with you that that fell into where I was good at being in almost every outlaw show, whether it was at Lincoln, whether it was at Williams Grove, whether it was at Hagerstown, the tracks would just get a lot drier than a regular show, and it just played right into my hand. And that goes back to your modified days. Correct. Well, you had to, like one of those uh, major league hitters seeing a <laughs> fastball coming in that looks like a softball. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what was it like winning those events? And you carried the banner for a while for the locals. I mean, it was you against Steve Kinzer. <laughs> Doug Wolf, whoever it was, was there added pressure for you during those events? Because it really was all about you beating them. Uh, there probably was, but, you know, just like anyone, just like any of the guys that run the car now for me, you know, you always put the most pressure on yourself. And, you know, I wanted, I really wanted to beat them guys because uh, first off, it's really gratifying and, I always say we're a low buck team. The car we put on the track is a very good car. It's as good a car as I can put on the track. Maybe, you know, I mean, all the motors are kind of the same now, but I, you know, I don't want anyone to think we're winning races with a subpar car. We're not, we just don't have six of them. You know, it's right. just, 
a totally different thing. We don't have a huge shop, you know, it, everything else where you can save money on, uh, we do naturally we have the smallest rig at the, at the track, you know, but it, it just, uh, sorry, I lost my thought. That's all right. <laughs> no, you truly do. And it's funny. You said it, you had that trailer you bought in the eighties for the longest. Yeah. I mean, you ran that till it, you needed to shoot it. And then, <laughs> And then you have what looks like a t-shirt trailer now, almost. You definitely put all the money into the car. We do. And that's why the car's never, never fancy. Uh, you know, I've had some of the guys that have been in the sport for a long time. You know, they'll say, when they'll look at my car, they'll say, this is a Carl Kinzer car. You have zero money spent on the paint but you have all the money spent <laughs> in all the right places, you know? So we, we try and put the best car out there. We can, you know, it is usually a good car. It's just a matter of doing everything right. It, it's been, you know, just amazing. Even nowadays, the budget difference between us and an outlaw team or the guys that we have to be Davey and myself talk about it all the time. Oh, we're so fortunate to be able to still be competitive at times with them. And uh, it, it's, it's actually really not to pat any of us on the back and we wouldn't be able to do it without Davey, but it, it's actually really amazing that people have no idea really of the vast difference of, you know, just the amount of equipment and, and money spent. It, it, it's, it's just amazing. I would, I would say I've, I've, characterized you guys and your team as a true throwback yeah it, because it, it's really done i mean you can't build the stuff like you used to no but you do take an old school approach is is that kind of do you think that's why you've been successful you do have this old school approach and it just keeps working it it does it's not it doesn't always work and i'm sure it's gonna stop but you know, it was kind of be, and not that this would be the same thing, but like when Alan Kowicki won the championship, mm -hmm. you know, he was uh, his own team, worked on the car himself, you know, and, and it's just kind of that thing. Why it works, I don't know. I have an old school way of doing everything. I, I had a good feel for the car when I used to, when I used to drive that I could get the car set up really well. And we're still carrying them setups over and, I really need to get back in the car because there's been too many changes now with the rules and that's how everyone's caught up to us. Some of our, you know, our setups are getting outdated and, and we're still kind of still running off them same setups that me and Davey both came to, you know, from years and years ago when I was running. So, uh, you know, it, it, that's how everyone caught up to us, but, uh, we'll, we'll keep going. You know, things have been going, you know, pretty good the last few weeks, we struggled in the beginning of the year just because we didn't race. There were so many rain outs and, right. and we just did not race. And as soon as we got four or five weeks there in a, in a, in a row, I could see, you know, we were turning it around. So you get to the late nineties and the two thousands, you really scale back, like you said, and you got injured somewhere along the line. Can, and, and you have a vertigo issue. I think it is, if I'm not mistaken. When did you get hurt that it really affected you? I actually didn't have vertigo. I, okay. I broke my back in 88. And then in 96 at the Grove, it, I landed real hard. And it uh, had some kind of spinal injury. And I forget okay. my wife, all the stuff for it. But I, but I never had vertigo. After my concussion stuff started and no one knew what it was, they kept treating me for vertigo and everything okay. else for what it was till I got to the right person, you know, but, uh, no, it, it was more just cost based to be honest with you from 2000 on, we just, you know, we almost always tried to run Williams Grove every week and then just, just pick our shows. It wasn't really because I was struggling with any injuries or anything. So you get to, I guess your last race in the car, when was it? 2011, 2000, 2000, 2010, 11, 12, somewhere in there. Actually, 15. Oh, okay. Because you put other people in the car in 2012. You started kind oh, of... Oh, you're, you're right. You're right. Yes, we did go with, with Ryan Smith. And I thought 
that was going to, even though I didn't officially retire, I thought I'd just jump in every now and then. But then, yes, you, you are 100% right. I was planning on not really racing much after that. So you do, but then you become an owner. Okay, just an owner. How difficult was that to watch somebody else drive your car, not be in the seat? We see it all the time. Uh, football players, you know, they, they miss that 80,000 people chanting their name. They they miss the, the locker room, whatever. Did you miss it when you were just an owner? It... It was hard, you know, it was, it was very hard, you know, and after, you know, once Lance got in the car, after I officially retired, things went so good right off the bat that it kind of filled that void, still not the same as when you drive yourself and win a race, you know, even if, when my daughter runs good or, or, or wins, it's still, and it's your kid, it's still not the same as when you do it, you know, so you're never going to replace that totally but we got what we got so we're old and <laughs> this is all we can do <laughs> you you put rodney west Tafer in it you know kind of you, you got in it in 2015 but then lance deweese becomes available and when this you hired him to me perfect it was perfect he he tried you guys have a similar driving style i think you guys have a similar language Guys are three Hall of Famers. That doesn't hurt. Uh, but, uh, what was that whirlwind like that first year? Did you expect to be that good out of the gate with him? It, there's, there's no way we could expect to be that good. But what was funny is, so the actual very last race I went, I knew I was screwed up, but didn't know what it was. And I just pulled off the track in the feature. The week before that, I won, though. I actually really won the last race that I really drove the whole thing, won the feature at the Grove. And we come in after that. I tell Davey, we we got it. Like, we're finally, you know, we were messing with a lot of different things. I said, this package is perfect. We finally found it, you know, and it'll work at all the different tracks, you know, some form of it. And so after we hired Lance, I knew – in my mind, Lance was the best PA driver available. So he wasn't taken, but if everyone was available and he was, you know, I would have still took him as, as first pick. I, right. you know, even if all the outlaws were available, like I knew Lance knew the tracks. I thought he was the only one that could run as good or better than me when the track got really slick. So when I ran, I would have to worry about him. That was it when the track got slick you know, normally. So I, I knew it could be a pretty good thing. So we immediately got the two motors we had updated, you know, spent a lot of money. And then, you know, it just all Lance stepped in there and it was just a perfect storm. Right. When we just kind of got cars figured out uh, and er everything just magically worked together. Yeah, you won National Opens, you won Tuscar 50s, you won a lot of big money races and it got to the point where the King's Royal wasn't the biggest one you won anymore. What was that all like to to win that many big races, to be a part of that? You had Davey next. It was it, When you say perfect storm, that's really correct because you had Davey, who you've been with forever, you know, Lance, who you got along with, uh, Cassidy, obviously helping out a lot when she when she could. Was that kind of the perfect scenario other than you obviously being behind the wheel? Oh, it, it, it was very magical. You know, we had to pinch ourselves all the time. I know a lot of times some of them big wins, you know, I go up to Davey and he was crying in victory lane. Like it, it, it was, you know, it, it really, uh, it was, it was just, it was amazing. Lance was very good to work with all the time. Always tried to help the team out he knew it was a low budget deal you know would do a special t-shirt and give the the team all the you know money that he made from that to you know put in a motor rebuild or what you know whatever it was whatever he did that every year he drove the car he always gave money back to the to the team so uh it was a dream to work with lance it, you know it was a dream that it went that uh that it went as well as it did seven and a half years about and 71 wins. 
and a lot of them big wins. Uh, obviously, I have to ask you what happened at the end. What? I mean, all good things come to an end. Yeah. Seven and a half years is a lifetime now in sprint car racing. What led to you guys splitting up? You're going to get the first real answer on this because I never really left it out. And I feel bad because Lance doesn't even know. Like, you know, Lance was very professional about it. I'm the asshole. You know, I called him and I just said, I didn't say you're fired, but I just said, I want to go a different direction with the team, you know, this and that. And, you know, he said, can I come up? Can't we talk about it? I said, I, I'd rather not because I think it's just going to get into an argument, you know, and left it there. And, and he never pushed me after that. You know, he never said, you know, please just tell me what I did wrong or this or that. The other thing I never explained it to him. And I, and I want to, and I, I just haven't, ever got to where I felt was the right time. But what happened was he went to run the Macri car at Eldora. And he asked me when he got the call from, from Nick, you know, and he said, Hey, I have a good opportunity to run that million dollar to win race at Eldora. Do you care? I said, no. So it was like a, you know, a Wednesday and Thursday thing. Right. But so the thing with the big Eldora race is the week after it's the summer nationals. It was at a time where we were probably struggling the most we've been struggling, you know, since Lance has been in the car for whatever reason. So we were building a new car. We were going to run it. I don't think the Grove was running, but Port Royal was still running. We were going to shake it down for the summer nationals that following week. And, right. you know, we had changed some stuff, just make sure everything was right. So Lance calls me from Friday, said, you know, his his son was with him. Cole said, uh, you know, Cole's getting a chance to work on a car because I had a crew when Lance came along and it's hard. Cole couldn't really work on our car because I already had all my guys and they all had their jobs. Yeah. And, you know, it, that's, it was just hard to fit them in, just like Cassidy. She'll, she'll sit there and won't be able to do anything when all my guys are there because they all have their jobs and I can't kick them out of their job. And it was the same thing with Cole. So Lance said, Hey, you know, there's a low crew down out here. Cole's getting to do a whole lot of stuff on the car. Do you care if we skip Port Royal and I stay out and run here Friday and Saturday? I said, no, that's fine. You know what? Susky was running Wednesday, uh, you know, before the summer nationals was Friday and Saturday. Right. I said, we weren't going to go to Susky. We'll just go, we'll just go to Susky, stay out there and have a good time. He came back, we go to Susky, and I remember I was messing around with wings. I tried a different wing, and he came in from warm-ups and said, you know, the car was real loose, and we were one of the three or four slowest cars that were there. So we changed some stuff around. We go out to time trials, and we were really slow. So it rains out after time trials. Yep. It rains out. They're running the show the next week. Uh, excuse me, the next night, which is Thursday, night before the Summer Nationals, I tell Lance at this point, Lance, I don't think we should come back. We need to prepare. Let me go through everything again, you know, for the Summer Nationals. So Lance doesn't look himself on – I couldn't tell at Susky. I really couldn't. But at the Grove, I could tell right away he doesn't look himself, and I can't I, – I don't really know – as to why, uh, but, and I was probably me jumping the gun on this because I went through all the concussion stuff. And until I got to Dr. Collins in Pittsburgh, okay, I mean, there was times when I was going to take my life. Like it, it was hard to get through the night. Like the, like you hear from the football players that took yep. their life, the ringing in the ears was so loud and bad. And, People don't understand. It's 24 hours a day. It don't stop. If you're talking, it's still doing it. If you're watching TV, when you try and lay down to go to sleep, you can't. Like, they, it just keeps going. Among all the other symptoms of it, you know, that was just one of them. So, anyway, I'm thinking, Lance didn't crash out there. It looks like he's messed up. And then a couple, he didn't even look right standing on the trailer. And a couple of guys actually said to me, is Lance feeling okay? Is there something wrong? He don't, he don't look right. He's like, 
half staggering around, but you know, kind of like I something was off. And on the track, it wasn't that he was trying not to run hard or anything, but it's like his timing was way off. Like he turned too early going into the corner. Like right. he, he he did not. He looked like someone that was just starting out to run sprint cars, you know, and. I was paranoid Lance was going to get hurt in the car. I, I, I really was. And I could not, we got to be kind of semi friends with his wife. And I'm thinking if he gets hurt in our car, because I knew that he wasn't right. His wife is going to come to me and want to freaking kill me, you know? And I, I just, I didn't even tell Lance because I knew if I would have said to Lance, you know, we got to take a break or we got to do something. I think, you know, somehow you got messed up from running El door four nights in a row. It must've shook your head up, even though you didn't, I, I don't know. I said there, there's something wrong, but I feel like it would have just led to an argument and he would have said, I'm fine. And he would have wanted to race and, you know, and I didn't want to get into an argument. I just figured we'll just stop it there. He got in the 39 then. And for, I don't know the exact time. I'm going to say two or three races. He didn't look like normal land. Like it looked like the same. Obviously that's a really, really fast car. And he didn't look any different than he looked in our car at the summer nationals. And then I know it was the dream race at Pork, And like the week before that Cassidy might've been running, you know, right behind him in the feature at Pork, Like it, it, when he was in the 39, like, Right. You know, you could see he was struggling and come back the next week, the dream race at port and Lance looks like himself. He, 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 all of a sudden he looked like he was back to normal. The announcer even said, I haven't seen Lance drive like this since he was in his twenties. You know, like he, he really actually looked good besides not being screwed up, you know, and I, and I, you know, pass him and talk to him and we'd say hi or talk or something. And, and he seemed fine. So it was probably me jumping the gun because I was worried about his safety and I just didn't want to go there. And at that time, now he's in the 39 for the end of the year. I'm not going to say to Lance, Hey, you know, do you want to come back right in the car? And that quick, you know, we got Logan Wagner and Logan was doing a good job for us. And Lance jumps into 12 for Charlotte. Even if I wanted to now, I wouldn't have felt right going to him. Like I knew before, before they raced, that was going to be a good situation for him because he would kind of be in control and feel like really comfortable and no pressure at all. Like no one would expect him to do anything in that. And I think he has looked really good this year, probably the best consistent car. I'm going to say maybe not overall the fastest all the time, right? but right. Grove and Port to me, He's the fastest, most consistent car. I think the wicker bill thing probably really helped them because now you have to drive the car with more finesse than you did before since it's only a one-inch wicker bill. And I think that worked right into his hands, and it's just a comfortable situation for him, uh, you know, and it was just uh, unfortunate, uh, you know, it was just an unfortunate thing in our car. Did you guys take, or you, I should say you, because you're the owner. Did you take a lot of blowback over that? Even though no one knew the real reason. And I appreciate you sharing that. Was there a blowback? Did you guys get a, did you get a lot of ill feelings from the public and whatever? Because he's beloved. There's no doubt about that. Tremendous amount and still getting it, by the way. (laughs) So, yeah. I mean, there was actual death threats in the beginning. So uh, you're a hundred percent right. No, Lance is very well liked, uh, you know, and the combination was good when he was in our car to sell a lot of merchandise and and everything, you know, it was just a good match that way and and worked perfect for him. And uh, yes, we're still getting blowback from that. (laughs) Oh, they are relentless. These sprint car fans. (laughs) There's There's no doubt about that. Um, you look where you're at, where are you at now? I mean, obviously Logan's a different driver. 
uh, which I'll talk about Darren Pittman in a minute, because when you guys rolled out at Williams Grove a few weeks ago and I saw him turn a lap, one lap in the heat race, I said, this night's over. So <laughs> looked really good. Trying to adjust, you're, you're dealing with, the tires are different. I don't care what anyone says, they're different. I'm hearing it everywhere. The wicker bill, different. Different driver. Is this a lot going on and, and how much is it kind of to overcome all that? It's it's very very hard. Logan is definitely a different driving style than than Lance. And when we needed a driver last year, and he called for the ride at that point outside of the National Open, and I I didn't at the time I hired Logan, I didn't really have Darren locked down yet. Uh, there was still the Dream Race at Port, and yep. there was the Outlaw shows at the end of the year. There was a Tuscarora, and. I thought Logan was a perfect fit for Port Royal and is for, uh, you know, because he can run the wall. And and I've seen him win there in the middle in the Zemco car. And, you know, uh, we have struggled to make the car 100 percent comfortable for him. I'm going to say, you know, he's found a groove there by the by the wall, you know, where he's made it happen the last, you know, three, four weeks, really, honestly, on his own. Uh, nothing we've done. And uh you know, but it, it's definitely different and it's hard because I obviously didn't drive like Logan. So I don't have them yeah. set ups and Darren just drives like a younger Lance. So that stuff with him, you know, just worked out. Last year, you know, I, I feel bad for Darren. I was talking to a, a friend of mine on the phone today and I don't get involved in emotion of whether drivers win or don't win. I feel bad for Darren Pittman for finishing second in the National Open. Six times he's done it. You were so good last year. You get passed. How heartbreaking was that? And how much are you looking forward to having him in the car again this year? Because honestly, if I'm picking favorites right now, it's probably you and David Gravel. It, you know, it's it, it's fun. I mean, it's fun going with Logan too. Darren is definitely a professional. It's, it's amazing that he could run a few times a year and be on that outlaw level, you know, uh, and it, in his in his own words. And one reason why we threw Knoxville in there, you know, he thinks that Williams Grove and Knoxville is really technical and can help him run against the young kids that run real hard because you have to hit your marks at those two tracks. Right. So that's why that's what we're doing, you know, those, those two tracks. And uh, he's been amazing to work with. He has a really good read on the car. You're working in a bigger box with him because he's just so smooth. He can run the top if he has to, you know, and he can run the bottom and he can run the middle. He can run anywhere. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's, it's actually like a whole nother, another level. And he really, uh it's just easy to work with so only got a couple more uh i was at port royal last week and i'm watching davy he's 90 years old how much does he amaze you because he because he sure as hell amazes me i hope to be just walking at 90 <laughs> years old this guy's still competitive he's still i think he was jiggling the car at the back and the whole car shaking do you just marvel at that i I told Davey, we actually were talking last night. I said, Davey, you did an incredible job again. The car was perfect. You know, everything. The 69K, the whole team, for some reason, the guys know, and they know how I am. <laughs> Probably difficult, but when it's a big race, everyone had their game face on. Logan was really on it. He was in the trailer all night, and I could just tell he was in like a super deep focus. And me and Davey were, and it's a hundred freaking degrees out. Davey's in long sleeve shirts. He has Jeez. to be in long sleeve shirt because he said your skin, when you get that old, is so scaly. If he rubs up against the car the wrong way, he starts bleeding and is on blood thinners and stuff. So that's why he has to wear a long sleeve shirt year round if he's around the car, working on the car, you know. So he's out there, long pants, long sleeve shirts, wool socks, you know, <laughs> out there in the middle of the heat. And he does not sit down. We're in the first heat race between the first heat 305s and late models were there. So it was a long night. 
till it was time to go out for the feature. He is just all over that car, you know, changing stuff. And uh, he did a very good job. You know, he very seldom doesn't do a good job. And he is just tireless. I mean, I will keep going all night like a nut. I can go full speed all night at the track. I can't do it four nights in a row, but uh, like that. And Davey will wear me out. <laughs> he, I, I just, I don't, and what he does still works. And I've yeah. always, you know, I've talked to Ricky Warner, who obviously, you know, Ricky Warner, one of the top yeah. guys ever in this sport. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. Work on the simple stuff. Is Davey like that as well? Is that his style and kind of the style of your team? Keep it simple. We, we do innovate stuff from time to time, but basically there's, there's no trick stuff. I don't know any trick stuff. When I was young, uh, I talked to Kenny Weld one time and asked him something about something. And he said, listen, he said, you'll, you'll find out. He said, I get calls every single day. What can I do to gain a half second? There's nothing you can do. This is words of Kenny Weld. And he was a hundred percent right. There's nothing you can do to gain a half second. There's nothing you can probably do to gain two to three tenths. You got to freaking grind it out and hope you gain a thousandths here a thousands there that it yeah. soon mounts up to half a tenth or something. You know, if you got half a tenth on them guys nowadays, that, that's tough to get, you know, that that's a lot. So we grind it out like that, you know, and we do everything the old school way. And the amazing part with Davey is if we have a setup that's working good, I will want to keep going back to the well. If the track's similar, uh, Davey, is very open to doing new and different things. And they're usually right at the time when I'm arguing with and I'm saying, Davey, I don't know if we should really do that. You know, if it's a regular show or something, okay. But I mean, he did it the one time when Lance won the national open, one of the national open wins, I think it might've been the first one. We had a setup in that night that we had never had in at Williams Grove. And it was the right thing to do. I would not have done it if Davey wouldn't have been there, but he, you know, he, he did it. We talked about it and, and he did. I agreed with him after he told me what it was, by the way, the car was reacting, but I would have never done it or thought of it. I'm just being real honest with you. Do you guys argue? Hard, we hardly ever, <laughs> Davey's not an arguing first person, first off, and I'm not an arguing person. I avoid confrontation at all <laughs> costs, which is why I left Lance go over the phone and didn't want to meet him in person, you know? And so we really, there has almost never been a crossword said, Davey will mumble under his breath and, and I will know what he means, you know? Yeah. And uh, so very few times I overrule him because one, it would just be stupid. You know, he's, he's going to be right more times than yeah. I'm going to be right. I have already, but he is still amazing. And I tell him about it every, like when he pulls something out that's different and it works, I'll say, Davey, I can't believe it. You know, you freaking amazed me again tonight, you know? So he, he is, I mean, I know him and Carl Kinzer are in the class of, of the best and Ricky Warner's working himself his way there, but, just because Davey's still gone, I have to put him ahead of Carl Kinzer. You know, he, he, he is just the best. I'm not going to argue. That's not after watching him last week again. Last thing, uh, how long are you going to do this? I mean, what what is the plan? I mean, obviously not driver-wise and all that other stuff, but, you know, how long does this ride keep going where you're a car owner fielding a car in these, these special shows? It's, you know, you never know. Like right now, I personally don't, uh, it's uncomfortable for me, but to be able to keep going, I don't own any of the motors. I don't own the trailer, uh, you know, so it's owned by outside people. So if something happens at any point, we're going to be in trouble. So I'll be looking to team up with someone else or something, something, you know, at that point. So, you know, for now, I'm content. You know, if the guys that own the stuff are content to keep going, uh, you know, we'll keep going. If not, 
then we'll have to figure <laughs> figure out what we're going to do. That'll be the next bomb that drops. So, uh, you know, you, you never know. It's, it, it's always day, day by day with us. Well, Donnie, or Don, Donnie, Donald, whatever you want to be called, I'm going to call you. Thank you very much for joining us on the deep dive. I appreciate it. It was enlightening. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was and fun. We'll, and I guess we'll see you at Speed Week for select shows again. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. That's going to wrap up this edition of the SprintCarLimited.com Deep Dive presented by Entrust IT Solutions. A big thank you to Don Kreitz Jr. for joining the show. A lot of good stuff there. Also, don't forget to click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel and also check out our daily exclusive content at www.sprintcarlimited.com. We'll be back next week with another edition of the Deep Dive.